Our scripture reading for today is from Genesis 21, verses 8 to 21. The child grew and was weaned. And on the day Isaac was weaned, Abram held a great feast. But Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar the Egyptian had borne to Abraham was mocking. And she said to Abraham, Get rid of that slave woman and her son. For that woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because it concerned his son. But God said to him, Do not be so distressed about the boy and your slave woman. Listen to whatever Sarah tells you, because it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. I will make the son of the slave into a nation also because he is your offspring. Early the next morning, Abram took some food and a skin of water and gave them to Hagar. He set them on her shoulders and then sent her off with the boy. She went on her way and wandered in the desert of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she put the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down about a bow shot away For she thought, I cannot watch the boy die. And as she sat there, she began to sob. God heard the boy crying, and the angel of God God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What is the matter, Hagar? Do not be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Lift the boy up and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. God was with the boy as he grew up. He lived in the desert and became an archer. While he was living in the desert of Paran, his mother got a wife for him from Egypt. Here ends our scripture reading. I'm going to begin my meditation this afternoon with a quote from Leonardo da Vinci who said, I've been impressed with the agency of doing. Knowing is not enough. We must apply. Being willing is not enough. We must do. End of quote. The Canadian international best-selling author Douglas Copeland delivers a real-time five-hour story set in an airport cocktail lounge during a global disaster. Five disparate people are trapped inside. Karen, a single mother waiting for her online date. Rick, the run-down, out-of-his-luck airport lounge bartender. Luke, a pastor on the run, and Rachel, a cool hitchhop blonde, incapable of true human contact, and finally, a mysterious voice known as Player One. Slowly, each reveals the truth about themselves while the world as they know it comes to an end. Copland explores the modern crisis of time, human identity, society, religion, and the afterlife. The book asks as many questions as it answers, and readers will leave the story with no doubt that we are in a new phase of existence as a species, and that there is no turning back. Quote, you should be spreading the good word. You should be etching the good word onto the glass scanning beds of library photocopiers. You should be scraping the truth onto old auto parts and throwing them off bridges so that people digging in the mud in a million years will question the world too. You should be carving eyeballs into tire treads and onto shoe soles so that your every trail speaks of thinking and faith and belief. You should be designing molecules that crystallize into poems of devotion. We should be making barcodes that print out truth, not lies. 
You shouldn't even throw away a piece of litter unless it is the truth stamped on it, a demand for people to reach a finer place. Your new life will be tinged with agency, as though you are digging out the victims of an avalanche. If you are not spending every waking moment of your life living the truth, if you are not plotting every moment to boil the carcass of the old order, then you are wasting your day. End of quote. This was the voice of player one in the book, What is to Become of Us. The same could be said if you were to take the Bible as a textbook of some sort, whether in history or science or some other field. There's a whole lot of different stuff that doesn't fit. And on top of that, there are different versions of so many stories that simply don't match with one another. Good luck studying for the final exam in that history course. I would like to offer an image or a metaphor for what the Bible may actually be more like. And it is this, a family scrapbook. If you imagine a scrapbook put together about a family, yours or someone else's, you can visualize a collection of all sorts of different material. A photograph here, a love letter there, a cherished recipe, an award someone received, and all these different pieces taken together, it gives you, at least begins to give you, an impression of who the family is, where they come from, how they understand themselves, and their identity. All of the different pieces come together to form a narrative of some sort or another, even as any one piece may not give the whole picture or even as some of the different pieces seem in places to contradict each other. I say all this today because it is easy to see in such a scrapbook the reality that most families are complicated, multifaceted, even confusing, and contradictory in their self-understanding. Even as such a scrapbook is probably assembled to embody and convey one story, one particular way of understanding who's, what's, and the why's, there is inevitably seems a piece here or there that challenges the predominant story or image of our understanding. Oh, I didn't know that great uncle Carl spent 10 years in prison. Or I didn't realize that Sally had a child out of wedlock. Whatever happened to that child, the story of what happens to Hagar and Ishmael is just such a story. The Hebrew Scriptures and the New Testament, which finds its primary home base within them, they form the family scrapbook of a people of God descended from Abraham and Sarah's son Isaac, and in particular, the ones descended from Isaac's younger son Jacob, whom we meet further down in the narrative. The overall story of who these people is and where they come from and what their relationship to God is, it comes out of that lineage and most of the material reflects that. But flipping back through the pages, we stumble upon an old photograph where we see another child, one named Ishmael, hanging out there in Abraham's tent and his mother Hagar standing there in the background. And we wonder, what's the story there? Somehow, even though the story is supposed to be about Isaac, we can't seem to ignore that old picture and its seemingly extra characters. And in seeing this about Hagar and Ishmael, we discover in the Bible itself the truth that God has other stories. Now I know that some of us may not be all that familiar with what's going on here with Hagar and Ishmael. So permit me here to bring us all up to speed. After all, this is another one of those times 
that because of the way the calendar falls, we have been plopped down in the middle of a scene already in progress. The story goes back further. As God promised to the many descendants, a great nation by which all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. God had promised them this much earlier on. As time passed, Sarah continued without child and they began to assume she was barren. So Sarah herself told her husband Abraham to try having a child with Sarah's servant, the Egyptian woman Hagar. Hagar gives birth to Ishmael. But as the story is told by those who have handed it down to us, the promise was still for Abraham and Sarah to bring forth descendants. We pick up with today's scene then, and Sarah's jealousy, if you will, of Ishmael and Hagar. Her worry that in a culture where the oldest child receives the primary inheritance, her own son Isaac, was going to be disadvantaged. Now, this part of the story, really the whole of the parts having to do with Hagar and Ishmael, it is disturbing to our modern ears on many accounts. And lest we presume ourselves so, so much superior to those we have gone before us, I like to imagine that it probably was at least a little disturbing to them too. As we hear it today, many, if not most of us, are taken aback by the casting out of Hagar and Ishmael, and also at the claim that God self-condoned and corroborated in it. It's valid to ask whether that's factually what happened, or whether it's a reflection of the ways Isaac's descendants told the tale. In any event, we should be careful too, though not to overlook the reality that Hagar herself gets so used and abused. She most likely had no choice about having Abraham go into her tent, as the Bible euphemistically puts it, and so her being cast out is but the latest in a much longer line of indignities and dehumanizations that Hagar suffers. When you look at a family scrapbook, or any other way family stories and histories are told. One of the fascinating and times profound things is how, what they show and about the past, about the origins, the roots, and how often it casts a revealing light on how things are today. Patterns of values and vices, graces and dysfunctions, They have this uncanny ability to continue playing out from generation to generation. There is that saying from the Bible about the sins of the parents being visited on the children and the children's children. And I think there is some truth to that. Not because of some vindictive will of God to keep punishing or because of some fatalistic consignment to fate, but because of the way these patterns and dynamics that play out have that tendency to keep playing out in the relationships and systems of our lives. At least that so often happens unless we make a concerted effort to truly change the system. And so, part of the power of Scripture, part of the way it does convey the word of the Lord to us, even as it remains also something of a family scrapbook, of those from whom in faith we come, is that it functions almost like a mirror to us and in our own lives. As we are confronted by a story like that of Hagar and Ishmael, a faithful grappling with such a story is going to ask challenging questions about what it may reveal, about what is still the case among us today. For instance, I at least am quite troubled by the fact that the story claims God's support and even permission for the casting out. But do we ourselves not still claim divine approval and even motivation for many a questionable thing? If you don't believe me, perhaps you will want to look up some of the images from a few years back in the Iraq 
and Afghanistan conflicts, where weapons were inscribed with God referencing messages and codes referring to Bible verses. Of course, many of us are disturbed also by the use and abuse of Hagar throughout this story. But is it not the case that all around the world today, and even in our own country, and in our own communities, that women are still robbed of their agency, even at times by other women? Or that plenty of people of African descent, remember Hagar was an Egyptian, making him an African, they are the brunt of situations that trace back to their past abuse and dehumanization by others. That is, they bear the negative consequences of a system that wasn't their fault in the first place. Hagar is cast out because of a child, but she wasn't the one in control to create that situation in the first place. We still live in a world where people of African descent are punished and even killed because those who are white fear them and yet we fear them because of what they themselves did to them over these nearly 500 years of European colonialism and American slavery. Stories like today's from the Bible should disturb us, but so too should the stories of our own times that the biblical witness casts its revealing light upon us. We can't change what happened to Hagar and Ishmael some three or four thousand years ago, but we can change what happens to people like Philando Castile or the young teen women forced to marry their rapists because you are not supposed to have a child out of wedlock. Or the children who are cast out into the street simply for being who they are. As I said a few moments ago, God has other stories. This scene with Hagar and Ishmael is but one of a myriad places in the Bible where these other stories pick their head in the dominant narrative. In this particular other story, we hear God's promise to Hagar and Ishmael that they would live and that a great nation would come of them as well. Many of us know that our Muslim sisters and brothers who are, as we are speaking, are celebrating the end of their month-long fast, trace their heritage to Abraham through Ishmael, we would be alert for where God still speaks through the stories of others. And the Bible is full of places within the main story where God is at work writing other stories, bringing light into the shadows, wrestling life out of death. After all, as the famous 20th century preacher William Sloan Coffin once said, as you know, he's one of my favorite persons, quote, we may be able to kill God's love, but we cannot keep it dead and buried. It's time that we ask, not what are we willing to give back, but what are we willing to give up for the sake of a just, equal, and racially and ethnically pluralistic community. Amen.